A way of life, a way of life, a way of life, a way of life. Islam is a way of life, a complete way. Do you know what Islam says? It says that life's the greatest. Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown. We now enter the phase where we will discuss the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament foretold the coming of three prophets. We understand the first two of those to be John the Baptist and Jesus Christ leaving one unfulfilled prophecy. At the same time, when we read the New Testament, we find Jesus Christ foretelling one final prophet to follow at the conclusion of his ministry. And so again, the evidence for the foretelling of the final prophet is not an Islamic evidence, is not just an Islamic evidence, it is also to be found in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments. So to begin with, I will give an introduction to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We will move on to two more episodes where we will discuss the evidences for his prophethood, for this is the crux of the matter. Can we validate the man Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a prophet or not? That will depend upon the evidence. So to begin with, Muhammad ibn Abdullah was born to the powerful tribe of the Quraysh in Mecca in or around the year 570 CE. His father died before he was born. His mother died when he was six years old. And he was raised by a Bedouin family who taught him caravan trading and sheep herding. He was known for certain qualities, even from childhood. He was known for ethics and honesty, gentleness, fairness, a very sober nature, he was known for having a deep contemplative spirituality, which only deepened and became more obvious as he matured. By the age of 40, he had secured a very comfortable life for himself. He was married to Khadija, a well-known and wealthy businesswoman. He had become himself wealthy, successful in society, a member of the powerful tribes in the Quraysh. He had children, wealth, high social standing. Yet, it was at this point that he started receiving revelation. And despite the wealth, the high social standing, the good position in which he lived, he basically went on to compromise everything that he had, in a worldly sense, to bear the message of revelation. He passed from this life in 632 CE. Now, it would be easy for me to project my opinion of the man Muhammad, peace be upon him, but what I would like to do over the next few minutes is read the opinions of others, historians, religious analysts, orientalists, and give you a flavor for their appreciation of Muhammad, peace be upon him. As I read these, understand that these are not the opinions of Muslims. These are the opinions of non-Muslims in most cases. In those cases where it is the opinion of a Muslim, I will identify it. But let us begin with Alexander Ross. No friend of the Islamic religion Alexander Ross was a declared anti-Islamic man. And yet, nonetheless, this is what he had to say. Quote, in speaking of Muhammad, quote, He did not pretend to deliver any new religion to them, but to revive the old one, which God gave first to Adam, and when lost in the corruption of the old world, restored it again by revelation to Abraham, who taught it his son Ishmael, their ancestor, and then he, when he settled first in Arabia, instructed men in the same. 
But their posterity degenerating into idolatry, God sent him now to destroy it and restore the religion of Ishmael. He allowed both of the Old and New Testament and that Moses and Christ were prophets sent from God. Keep in mind that this is what we discussed in much of the previous series of these episodes. Quote, he allowed both of the Old and New Testament and that Moses and Christ were prophets sent from God, but that the Jews and Christians had corrupted these holy writings and that he was sent to purge them from those corruptions and to restore the law of God to that purity in which it was first delivered. And is this not what we have already discussed, the fact that Islam understands the previous prophets as just that, men as prophets, including Abraham, Moses, and Jesus Christ, but that at the same time, Islam understands the word of God to be represented in the Old and New Testaments, but that there is corruption to the Old and New Testaments as well, hence the need for a final clarifying revelation conveyed by the final predicted prophet as encountered in the Old and New Testaments. Now, a somewhat longer description, but very worthwhile, simply because in reading this, I feel myself I could not say it any better. This was written over 200 years ago by Stanley Lane Poole in a time when it was dangerous, not just difficult, but actually dangerous for a man to express a positive opinion of Islam. In England, to express a positive opinion of Islam 200 years ago was to put your life on the line. And yet, this is what Stanley Lane Poole wrote. Quote, Muhammad was of middle height, rather thin but broad of shoulders, wide of chest, strong of bone and muscle. His head was massive, strongly developed. Dark hair, slightly curled, flowed in a dense mass almost to his shoulders. Even in advanced age, it was sprinkled with only about 20 gray hairs produced by the agonies of his revelations. His face was oval-shaped, slightly tawny of color. Fine, long, arched eyebrows were divided by a vein which throbbed visibly in moments of passion. Great black, restless eyes shone out from under long, heavy eyelashes. His nose was large, slightly aquiline. His teeth, upon which he bestowed great care, were well-set, dazzling white. A full beard framed his manly face. His skin was clear and soft, his complexion red and white. His hands were as silk and satin, even as those of a woman. His step was quick and elastic, yet firm as that of one who steps from a high to a low place. In turning his face, he would also turn his whole body. His whole gait and presence was dignified and imposing. His countenance was mild and pensive. His laugh was rarely more than a smile. Stanley Lane Poole goes from a description of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his habits. Quote, in his habits, he was extremely simple. Though he bestowed great care on his person, his eating and drinking, his dress and his furniture retained, even when he had reached the fullness of power, their almost primitive nature. The only luxuries he indulged in were, besides arms, which he highly prized, a pair of yellow boots, a present from the Negus of Abyssinia. Perfumes, however, he loved passionately, being most sensitive to smells. Strong drink he abhorred. He was gifted with mighty powers of imagination, elevation of mind, delicacy and refinement of feeling. He is more modest than a virgin behind her curtain, it was said of him. He was most indulgent to his inferiors and would never allow his awkward little page to be scolded whatever he did. Ten years, said Anas, his servant, was I about the prophet, and he never said as much as oof to me. He was very affectionate towards his family, 
One of his boys died on his breast in the smoky house of the nurse, a blacksmith's wife. He was very fond of children. He would stop them in the streets and pat their heads. He never struck anyone in his life. The worst expression he ever made use of in conversation was, what has come to him? May his forehead be darkened with mud. When asked to curse someone, he replied, I have not been sent to curse, but to be a mercy to mankind. He visited the sick, followed any funeral bier he met, accepted the invitation of a slave to dinner, mended his own clothes, milked the goats, and waited upon himself. Related summarily another tradition, he goes on, he never first withheld his hand out of another man's palm and turned not before the other had turned. He was the most faithful protector of those he protected, the sweetest and most agreeable in conversation. Those who saw him were immediately suddenly filled with reverence. Those who came near him loved him. Those who described him would say, I have never seen his like either before or after. He was of great taciturnity. But when he spoke, it was with emphasis and deliberation, and no one could ever forget what he said. After that beautiful description, it's time to take a quick break. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Is a way of life, a complete way. Welcome back. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown, and we are continuing this episode painting a word profile of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I will continue with another opinion, not from one of his friends, but from one of his enemies. George Sale, one of the early translators of the Holy Quran, hated Islam and hated the man Muhammad. And yet, this is what he had to say about him. Quote, for however criminal Muhammad may have been in imposing a false religion on mankind, now is there any doubt that this man hates Muhammad and Islam? We learn the vehemence of his hatred from his words, and yet see how he continues. The praises to his real virtues ought not to be denied him, nor can I do otherwise than applaud the candor of the pious and learned Spanhemius, who though he owned him to have been a wicked impostor. Now these are his enemies, the worst of his enemies, and yet, they say, yet acknowledged him to have been richly furnished with natural endowments, beautiful in his person, of a subtle wit, agreeable behavior, showing liberality to the poor, courtesy to everyone, fortitude against his enemies, and above all, a high reverence for the name of God. Severe against the perjured, adulterers, murderers, flanderers, covetous, false witnesses, etc., a great preacher of patience, charity, mercy, beneficence, gratitude, honoring of parents, and superiors, and a frequent celebrator of the divine praises. And these are the words of his enemy. So we see in this a true picture of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in that if your enemies speak well of you, how can there be any bad to you? In a hadith in which Ali ibn Abi Talib the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave a description that is well respected. Quote, he was not vulgar, nor did he condone vulgarity. And he was not one to shout in the marketplace. He did not reward evil with evil, rather he would forgive and overlook. He never in his life struck anything with his hand except when he was fighting in the name of Allah. He never struck a servant nor a woman. And I never saw him take revenge for an injustice dealt him, except if the prohibitions of Allah were transgressed. For if the prohibitions of Allah were transgressed, he was among the strongest of them in anger. He was never given a choice between two matters, 
but he chose the simplest of the two. If he entered into his home, he was a man like any other, cleaning his own garment, milking his own goat, and serving himself. He was continually smiling, gentle in manners, soft in nature. He was not severe, hard-hearted, loud, abusive, or miserly. He would disregard that which he disliked, and no one ever despaired of him. He never responded to disparagement or evil words. He forbade himself three things, argument, arrogance, and that which did not concern him. And he relieved the people of three. He would not degrade any among them or abuse them. He would not search after their honor or private matters. And he would not speak except in matters which he hoped to be rewarded for. When he spoke, his attendees would lower their heads as if birds had lighted upon them. Once he finished, they would speak. They would not vie with one another in his presence to speak, but when one would talk in his presence, the rest would listen until he finished. Speech in his presence was that of the first among them. He would laugh with them and wonder with them. He had patience with the strangers when they were gruff in speech and requests, to a degree that his companions would fetch them to him. He would say, if you see someone in need, fetch him to me. He would not accept praise except from those who were balanced and not excessive. He would not interject into someone's speech unless they transgressed, in which case he would either rebuke them or else leave. In another hadith related by Bukhari and Muslim, quote, he was the most generous of heart, truthful of tongue, softest in disposition, and noble in relationship. The English archaeologist and scholar D.G. Hogarth wrote as follows. Serious or trivial, serious or trivial, his daily behavior has instituted a canon which millions observe at this day with conscious mimicry. No one regarded by any section of the human race as perfect man has been imitated so minutely. The conduct of the founder of Christianity has not so governed the ordinary life of his followers. Moreover, no founder of a religion has been left on so solitary an eminence as the Muslim apostle. And this is exactly in accordance with what we described earlier in one of my talks in which I described how we find the example of Jesus, peace be upon him, his example better exemplified in the appearance, the manners, the practices of worship and the creed among the practices of the Muslims than among the practices of those who consider themselves Christian. And yet in both cases, it is the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is most closely exemplified, most closely emulated among his followers. His character was well documented by Washington Irving. Quote, he was sober and abstemious in his diet and a rigorous observer of fasts. He indulged in no magnificence of apparel the ostentation of a petty mind. Neither was his simplicity in dress affected, but the result of a real disregard to distinction from so trivial a source. His military triumphs awakened no pride, no vainglory, as they would have done had they been affected for selfish purposes. In the time of his greatest power, he maintained the same simplicity of manners and appearance as in the days of his adversity. So far from affecting regal state, he was displeased if, upon entering a room, any unusual testimony of respect were shown him. If he aimed at universal dominion, it was the dominion of the faith. As to the temporal rule which grew up in his hands, as he used it without ostentation, so he took no step to perpetuate it in his family. The riches which poured in upon him from tribute and the spoils of war were expended in promoting the victories of the faith and in relieving the poor among its votaries. 
insomuch that his treasury was often drained of its last coin. What is he saying? He is saying all the wealth that came from the position of his office, he distributed to the poor and needy, and others who would benefit. Omar ibn al-Harith declares that Muhammad at his death did not leave a golden dinar nor a silver dirham, a slave nor a slave girl, nor anything but his gray mule, his arms, and the ground which he bestowed upon his wives, his children, and the poor. Allah, says the Arabian writer, offered him the keys of all the treasures of the earth, but he refused to accept them. And so we find in this the example of a very human messenger described both by his friends, companions, and allies, but also by his enemies. The point being that his attributes were undeniable. For now, I will close this segment with a description from Hind. Quote, The messenger of Allah was of consecutive sorrows, continuous thought, never finding rest long in silence. He did not speak without cause. He spoke with his full mouth, in other words, was not arrogant, and spoke concisely. His speech was just with neither excess nor deficiency. He was not pompous nor denigrating. He exalted all blessings no matter how small and never belittled a single one. And with that, I would like to conclude this section and we will plan to continue, inshallah, with the discussion of the evidences for the prophethood of Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Until next time, this is Dr. Lawrence Brown bidding you peace and looking forward to the next episode. Do you know what Islam is?